Hello and welcome to ELA grade 12 for the week of May 11th, lesson two. Today you will analyze an author's use of syntax in order to explain its impact on meaning, theme, and tone in a work. In the last two lessons, you've explored diction, which is the author's choice of words, and how that creates tone and develops a theme. Today, you will add to your analysis of author style by exploring syntax, which is the arrangement of words into sentences. That may sound very basic and simple, but when you consider all the different ways that authors utilize syntax to create their own style and develop and emphasize meaning, it is anything but simple. Think about the different ways authors use syntax in texts that you've read. What does syntax look like in different types of texts? Think of poetry, fiction, informational texts, or how-to documents. How can authors use syntax to create desired effects? Next, we'll take a look at some different examples of syntax from different writers. This first example is from The Great Gatsby. It reads, the groups change more swiftly, swell with new arrivals, dissolve and form in the same breath. Already there are wanderers, confident girls who weave here and there among the stouter and more stable, become for a sharp, joyous moment the center of a group, and then, excited with triumph, glide on through the sea change of faces and voices and color under the constantly changing light. So in this example, we have a very lengthy and descriptive sentence. We see semicolons and conjunctions used to join words and phrases together, and it gives the reader a very vivid vision of the scene. So this is one of Gatsby's parties, and the syntax really creates this sense of continual movement and motion of the partygoers. So this next example comes from Knight. We've got two different very short passages. So the first one reads, two lambs without a shepherd, free for the taking, but who would dare? Fear was greater than hunger. The second one, Get up, how could I? How could I leave this warm blanket? I was hearing my father's words, but their meaning escaped me. So in this example, we see that Wiesel is using rhetorical questions. In the first, the way that this is set up, it has our thoughts really following the chronology that he has set up for us. He references an unguarded cauldron of soup when he mentions the lambs. And as readers, we know that this is so tempting to the prisoners. Yet the question that follows really brings us back to reality when it says, who would dare? We know that none would dare go for it. And so our own thoughts then are confirmed with the following sentence that fear is greater than hunger. In this way, Wiesel has really led us to imagine the progression of the thoughts and feelings of the narrator in that situation. In the second example, the rhetorical questions are meant to again draw readers into the inner thoughts and feelings of the narrator to allow us to understand that though he should want to get up and in this case live rather than die, the comfort of giving in to his exhaustion overwhelms him in that moment. So you'll see how in both of these examples, the syntax used by the authors really helps to enhance meaning. Let's take a look at another passage. This one comes from Marita's Bargain. Pip is a middle school. Classes are large. The fifth grade has two sections of 35 students each. There are no entrance exams or admissions requirements. Students are chosen by lottery with any fourth grader living in the Bronx eligible to apply. Roughly half of the students are African-American, the rest are Hispanic. Three quarters of the children come from single parent homes. Notice that in this example, we have short sentences, and even sentences that are longer are sort of divided into two short clauses. These work to allow Gladwell to state basic facts about the Kip school that are important to the reader's understanding of his overall message that is developed in the text. So this allows him to really kind of give us a lot of information and make the passage feel very informative. Let's take a look at one more example. This one comes from the speech on the Vietnam War. We have destroyed their two most cherished institutions, the family and the village. We have destroyed their land and their crops. We have cooperated in the crushing of the nation's only non-communist revolutionary political force, the unified Buddhist church. We have supported the enemies of the peasants of Saigon. We have corrupted their women and children and killed their men. So in this example, you may notice the use of parallelism and repetition. 
both techniques which are heavily utilized by Martin Luther King in his speeches, and techniques that really helped his audience follow his line of reasoning as well as stay engaged in his arguments. So we looked at four very differing styles of syntax so that you could really get a sense of the way that syntax creates both style and meaning. Next, we will apply our understanding of syntax as part of an author's style, and we will read the text Living Like Weasels by Annie Dillard. So I'm going to read paragraph one aloud. You can follow along with me on your copy of the text. As I read, I'm going to examine the syntax of the paragraph using the guiding types of syntax, which you see listed here on the left side of my screen. I'll look for examples of differing sentence length, inverted syntax, and any clauses or parentheticals that seem significant. A weasel is wild. Who knows what he thinks? He sleeps in his underground den, his tail draped over his nose. Sometimes he lives in his den for two days without leaving. Outside, he stalks rabbits, mice, muskrats, and birds, killing more bodies than he can eat warm and often dragging the carcasses home. Obedient to instinct, he bites his prey at the neck, either splitting the jugular vein at the throat or crunching the brain at the base of the skull, and he does not let go. One naturalist refused to kill a weasel who was socketed to his hand deeply as a rattlesnake. The man could in no way pry the tiny weasel off, and he had to walk half a mile to water, the weasel dangling from his palm, and soak him off like a stubborn label. So as I was examining the syntax of this paragraph, I noticed that the paragraph begins with a short, simple sentence. That is followed by a rhetorical question. Who knows what he thinks? So we have a simple sentence, the weasel is wild, to state that simple point, but then a question to get us as readers involved in thinking a bit further and more deeply about what the author might mean in her statement that the weasel is wild. What follows are two more sentences that are a bit longer. And then as we read on, we notice that the sentences become even longer and more complex. This style helps grab the reader's attention and focus them in on Dillard's detailed description of the weasel. Next, I'll read paragraph two aloud. As I do, you should read on your own copy of the text and examine the syntax of the paragraph using the guiding types of syntax lift, listed again on the left side of my screen here. Look for examples of differing sentence lengths, inverted syntax, and any clauses or parentheticals that seem significant. And once, says Ernest Thompson Seton, once a man shot an eagle out of the sky. He examined the eagle and found the dry skull of a weasel fixed by the jaws to his throat. The supposition is that the eagle had pounced on the weasel and the weasel swiveled and bit as instinct taught him, tooth to neck and nearly won. I would have liked to have seen that eagle from the air a few weeks or months before he was shot. Was the whole weasel still attached to his feathered throat, a fur pendant? Or did the eagle eat what he could reach, gutting the living weasel with his talons before his breast, bending his beak, cleaning the beautiful airborne bones? Review that paragraph once more and make some notes about the syntax in the paragraph and how it creates meaning and tone. I'll give you about 30 seconds to do that. So you may have noted that the paragraph is composed of three sentences and two questions. The third sentence and two following questions are longer and more complex than the first two sentences of the paragraph. They also contain very detailed description. The first question comes at the end of the statement, I would like to have seen that eagle from the air a few weeks or months before he was shot. The two questions that follow that are the author's thoughts about possible scenarios for what might have happened. 
So the way that this is set up really allows the reader to feel the sense of wonder and curiosity that the author feels in imagining what happened in that scenario. What else did you notice about the syntax of this paragraph? Now that we've looked closely at syntax, we're going to look at how we can imitate the style of the author. Imitating the syntactical structures produced by professional writers is a great way to expand your choices of how to form sentences when you are doing your own writing. So next we'll study each example sentence and create an imitation sentence with the same grammatical pattern, but using your own content. Sentence imitation one. Or did the eagle eat what he could reach, gutting the living weasel with his talons before his breast, bending his beak, cleaning the beautiful airborne bones? So you have this sentence on your paper as well, and you can mark it up as we go through the different parts of the sentence. So you'll notice when you look at this sentence that it begins with a conjunction. Remember, conjunctions are words like and, but, or, yet. That's followed by the subject of the sentence, the eagle, and the predicate, which in this case is eat. As modifiers, Dillard follows that up with the phrases, gutting the living weasel with his talons, bending his beak, and cleaning the beautiful airborne bones. Notice that each of these phrases begin with a verb that ends in ing. These are called participial phrases. So the grammatical structure of this sentence looks something like this. Conjunction plus subject plus predicate plus participial phrase plus participial phrase plus participial phrase. When you imitate this sentence, you'd want to follow that same grammatical structure. And remember that this is actually a rhetorical question, so you'll want to write a question, not a statement. What animal might you write about? What might it be doing that you could describe? Let's take a look at the second example sentence. This one reads, that is, I don't think I can learn from a wild animal how to live in particular. Shall I suck warm blood, hold my tail high, walk with my footprints precisely over the prints of my hands? But I might learn something of mindlessness, something of the purity of living in the physical senses and the dignity of living without bias or motive. So what do you notice about the way that this sentence is organized? You don't have to identify the names of the phrases or the clauses, but try to break up the sentence into logical pieces. How might you break this sentence up? So if you look at each piece of the sentence, in the first piece, which you see in purple, we can identify the subject and the predicate being I and don't think. If we move to the second piece of the sentence, you will notice it's a question. The author is asking, what shall she do? And uses three parallel verbs. Shall I suck warm blood, hold my tail high, walk with my footprints precisely over the prints of my hands? If we look at the third piece of the sentence, we see that it is connected to the first part by a conjunction, that word but. The subject I is repeated and we have a second predicate, might learn. That is then followed with what she might learn, something of mindfulness, mindlessness, which is then fo followed by a clause that modifies or gives more information about the something of mindlessness. So when you imitate this sentence, you'll want to follow this structure as best you can. At this point in the lesson, you should complete the sentence imitations and then move on to the show what you know portion. In the show what you know, you'll read the remaining selection from the text, Living Like Weasels, considering the author's overall theme and tone as you analyze her syntax. You will then complete the effects of syntax chart to record examples of interesting or unique syntax 